begin in this wonderful book that is a continuation of where we left off in Deuteronomy. Moses is gone, dead and buried on Mount Nebo, and now Joshua takes up the mantle of leadership. I'm going to read verses 1 through 9 of Joshua chapter 1, but I want us to think of this sermon in large part as an introduction. Uh, I sent you all an email a little bit before evening worship uh, that has attached to it two documents. One is a PDF, one is an EPUB, which is an ebook reader format, of Calvin's introduction to his commentary on the book of Joshua. It's phenomenal. <laughs> And I would encourage you to read it uh, because it, it puts you in the right headspace uh, and sort of hermeneutical idea of how we are to move through Joshua properly. And one of the hard things about starting any book of the Bible is how do you approach it? <laughs> how do you get your arms around it? And so some of those first sermons uh, are spent kind of feeling out what it will endeavor, what I'm endeavoring to do, and what it will eventually feel like. And so uh, this evening, as we move through my outline, um, I'm going to read a good bit from this introduction. I'm going to give Calvin all the credit. Uh, Calvin, by the age of 26, finished <laughs> the Institutes of Christian Religion. Uh, by 26, I was pushing against God in a call to ministry, so <laughs> a man of great spiritual maturity he was, died at a very young age, just 56, uh, but mightily used by God, and a great exegete, especially in the era in which he lived. He did not have the benefit that we have now of four to five hundred years of good reformed ecclesiology and reformed biblical interpretation. So I'm going to read verses one through nine, and then we're going to move through this sermon trying to get us to understand where we are going and how we are to properly interpret this book. Uh, read along with me, if you would, if you have your copy of God's Word. I'll begin reading in verse 1. I'll read to verse 9 of chapter 1. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise, go over this Jordan, you and all this people, to the land which I am giving to them, the children of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given to you, as I said to Moses from the wilderness and this Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, and to the great sea toward going down of the sun shall be your territory." No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and of good courage, for to this people you shall divide as an inheritance the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous." that you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, that you may prosper wherever you go. This book of the law, which are the first five books of the Bible, the Pentateuch, shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Have I not commanded you, be strong and of good courage? Do not be afraid, nor be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Thus far the reading of God's word. Let me pray now for the blessing of the preaching of it. Lord, we come to you this evening, and we ask that I might contend well for the truth of your word, that we would all be sensitive and humble under the preaching of it, that we might follow our Joshua, our Jesus, our Messiah, our Redeemer, in the mission of taking the land, of spreading the good news abroad, of nurturing and providing a dwelling place whereby you might come and live with us and we with you all the days of our life. We ask this in your holy 
and precious name. Amen. I've said it already. This evening is a bit of an introduction. Uh, it is a, a taking of what Calvin calls the argument. That's the introduction of the prologue to his commentary upon which he touches upon themes uh, that continued through the first five books of the Bible into the book of Joshua, and I would argue are very relevant for us today as the church. Three points that I want to make this evening related to those things. The first, a faithful leader. That is Joshua himself, a faithful leader. Secondly, the people of God move on. The people of God move on. And then thirdly, Joshua could only take them so far. Joshua could only take them so far. And so let's look at that first point now. Joshua, a faithful leader. Now, if we look at the life of Joshua, he began as an assistant, an apprentice to Moses himself. In fact, in Deuteronomy chapter 24, this is how he is referred to. In verse 13 of Deuteronomy 24, we read, So Moses arose with his assistant Joshua. I want you to think intern. He got to see firsthand the failures, the successes, the highs, and the lows. You may wonder what Joshua was thinking when God said, Oh, by the way, Joshua, you're next. Oh, man. But faithful. In fact, I don't think Joshua would have said that at all. Joshua was not only assistant to Moses, but he was also the faithful spy along with Caleb. And in Numbers chapter 13, you may remember, not necessarily from my sermon, but from all the stories you heard growing up, it's hard to forget, when God brings that first generation after a number of weeks, one, not wandering, but moving from Egypt to the border, uh, the border of Egypt to the border of the land of promise, through the Red Sea to Sinai, and on from Sinai to the border of Canaan, the land of promise. In Numbers chapter 13, the Lord says in verse 1 to Moses, Send men to spy out the land of Canaan, which I am going to give to the people of Israel. Send a man from every tribe, every leader among them. And Joshua and Caleb were chosen among other others, ten others to be exact. They went into the land, they spied it out, and then they brought back a report later in Numbers chapter 30. We read or in verse 30 of that report. Caleb told the people in front of Moses to be quiet. Why? Because when they gave the report, the people of God lamented that it was going to be a challenge, that there were giants living in the land, and despite the glorious fruitfulness of that land, they did not think they could go in and take it. And Caleb says, be quiet. Let us go up at once and take the land, for we are well able to take it in battle. Now, why did Caleb say this? I like the be quiet part. <laughs> why did he say the other part? Because they doubted, they feared. And all that Israel had seen up to that point, why were they afraid? Why are you afraid of anything? Kids, why are you afraid of the dark? Why are you afraid of anything? It relates to and is connected to our lack of trust in the sovereignty of God and the fulfillment of his promises which God made directly to them. And Joshua himself spoke up in the next chapter, verse 6. Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, tore their clothes. They were among those who spied out the land. They said to all the people of Israel, The land we pass through to spy out is a very good land. If the Lord is pleased with us, he will bring us into that land and give it to us. It is a land flowing with milk and honey. Only do not go against the Lord. Do not be afraid. How many times did God repeat this to Israel? We see it twice in chapter 1, verses 1 through 9. Only be strong and of good courage. Do not be dismayed. Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. Why? Because we are, as those who fail to often trust in God as we should, fear. And Joshua ends that little sermon, do not be afraid of them. Joshua was a faithful assistant, he was a faithful spy, and he would be a faithful successor. And so as we look at this faithful leader, we see him faithful throughout all of his life. 
We see him faithful to the Lord. Why? Because God made him thus. Because God called him. Because God sanctified him. Joshua is a great picture of the grace and power of God at work in the heart of a man. Why Joshua? Because God chose him. Why Caleb? Same reason. God had given to Joshua a great gift, and that is courage. And so, God would call Joshua to take the reins. And in fact, in Deuteronomy chapter 1, which is the narrative opening of a series of sermons which forms almost the entire book of Deuteronomy, we read of God's anger. The Lord says, Even you, burning against Moses because of his sin, shall not go in there, the promised land. That's verse 37 of chapter 1. Joshua, the son of Nun, who stands before you, he shall go in there, encourage him, for he shall cause Israel to inherit it. He will be the instrumental cause of Israel's success. And then Deuteronomy chapter 31, as it relates to Joshua, the successor, Moses went and spoke these words to all Israel, and he said to them, I am 120 years old. I can no longer go out and come in. Also, the Lord has said to me, you shall not cross over the Jordan. The Lord your God himself crosses over before you. He will destroy these nations from before you, and you shall dispossess them. Joshua himself crosses over before you, just as the Lord has said. Joshua is leading them into the land of promise. And God would do with Joshua what he had done through Moses to mark Joshua's authority. As Moses led Israel through the Red Sea, what will Joshua do? He will lead them to the Jordan River. A miraculous sign authenticating his leadership. This is why the apostles performed miracles. Why? To show that they were in fact speaking on behalf of the one who performed miracles, Christ. This is the role of miracles in Scripture, which is a whole other sermon. <laughs> but Joshua was called. He was called to be a faithful leader. And not only was there a faithful leader given, but there is a faithful transition. So here is the first of a number of quotes that I'm going to read from Calvin's commentary. He writes, On the death of Moses, a sad change seemed impending. The people were left like a body with its head lopped off. While thus in danger of dispersion, not only did the truth of God prove itself to be immortal, but it was shown in the person of Joshua as in a bright mirror. That when God takes away those whom he has adorned with special gifts, he has others in readiness to supply their place. And that though he is pleased for a time to give excellent gifts to some, his mighty power is not tied down to them. But he is able as often as it seems to him good, to find fit successors. Nay, to raise up from the very stones persons qualified to perform illustrious deeds. This is not the end. Calvin is touching upon a timeless principle. Moses is not integral to the fulfillment of the promises of God. He is part... But he is not the sum and substance of the hope of Israel. And guess what? Neither was Joshua. Imagine for a moment you're there. You are part of the second generation of Israel. And you are looking forward to going into that land. The first generation failed. And here you stand on the brink of the Jordan River. And Moses is gone that great leader, 40 years in Egypt, 40 years outside of it in exile, and then 40 years he walked with Israel as their pastor, as their prophet, as a judge, as the mouthpiece of God, and he's gone. There are many churches that do not survive simply a pastoral change. He's gone. There there won't be anybody else like that pastor. But God sees fit 
in his timing to do what we cannot. To raise up leaders from seemingly nothing, those who can, can, can continue to do the work that God has begun. And so when times seem bleak, when we might give up hope, God's got it. He has it. And Joshua is a testimony of this faithful transition. And God will authenticate in the eyes of the people Joshua's calling. And that will come in the passing over the Jordan River. But he's also saying of Joshua the same things he said of Moses. He is the next leader of Israel. And because of this faithful transition, we can then, they could then, look forward. Because Joshua was chosen and called the right and rightful successor of Moses, Israel could then turn their eyes to the promised land because Joshua would cross over before them. And twice God says, be strong and of good courage. Be strong and of good courage. Do you think there were moments in Joshua's life where he went, I don't know what's going to happen. I imagine there were some moments of great humanity, like in Moses' life, where he goes into the tent and he's spitting mad. And he's convening with the Lord and the Lord is angry with Israel. This ministry of going over before Israel into the land to lead battle will not be an easy one. And so what we find at the end of this section on the life of Joshua is that movement forward in fulfillment to the promises of God's covenant is solely the product of God's power and grace. Moses was Moses because God made Moses Moses. And the same is true for Joshua. The same is true for you and it's for me. Okay, let's go to that point where they move on. The people of God move on. Secondly, what was Israel called to do? They were called to go in and take the land. But the problem is it was an empty land. When this nation was first founded, there were moments in which those were on the east coast were beginning to move west, and there were many open spaces. And you could go, and you could plant your flag, and that land was yours. As Israel was going into the land, it wasn't empty. It was filled. And it was filled with the kinds of people who had committed great sinful violations against the law of God. These were not righteous people. They were wicked, violent, pagan idolaters. And even as Israel was called to be holy, they were called to go into the land and make the land holy. For if God is to dwell among us, there can be no impurity among us. We learn this from the laws of God and especially the laws of the book of Leviticus. God was calling Israel to purge the leaven out of the land. And again, we turn to Calvin where he writes, Moreover, though they had been ordered to purge the sacred territory of all pollutions in order that no profanation of the pure and legitimate worship might remain, they allowed the impious superstitions which God abhorred to be practiced as before. We know this because at the, the end of the book of Joshua and the beginning of the book of Judges, Israel had not finished the job. They had not committed the entire land and the inhabitants of that land, those evil parts of it, to destruction. And what we learn is that man is, in every generation, not up to the task what is impossible with man, though, is, is possible with God. Israel failed, or they would fail. We have the benefit, as it were, of knowing the whole story before we start the story, or at least how it ends. They failed to devote it all to destruction. It is a picture of our own sanctification in some fashion, isn't it? We leave things untouched. Lord... I'll keep the nine if you let me keep one. I will keep all of the commandments if you let me keep anger, lust, greed, avarice. Can I have one of those, Lord? No. The leaven of sin is to be purged. It's like trying to quit smoking or drinking too much. The stash that no one knows about has got to go. 
You can't have the little closet that no one knows of or that little room or that little hidden compartment. It must all be purged. Israel was called as the arm of God's righteousness and justice to purge from the land all that would profane holy worship. Calvin says again, their obstinate incredulity. I think that's the first time I've ever said that word properly. (laughs) That's a word I have a, a real hard time saying. Betrays itself in their disregard of the penalty denounced against such transgression. But they at length learned by experience that God had not threatened in vain. That those nations whom they had wickedly spared, would prove to them thorns and stings. You know of the Ites, the Amorites, the Jebusites, and all of those nations that they failed to remove from the land. By the time the judges came, they had become quite a thorn, as Calvin says, and a sting. And they would learn through their failure. Their failure, Calvin says, reminded the children of God that they were to look forward to a more excellent state where the divine favor would be more clearly displayed, nay, would be freed from every obstruction and shine forth in full splendor. Now, what is Calvin or whom is Calvin speaking of? The greater Joshua. And so as those who have the benefit of looking back, we have this great hermeneutical advantage that we have seen the greater Joshua. And we ought to read Joshua not pretending that we don't know about Jesus, but laying all of the cards on the table and seeing this book for what it is. It is a picture of God, what God would continue to do for his people, yes. But the culmination of all of those things in the person and work of Jesus Christ. Now, not only would Israel fail... But one of the reasons why Israel grew discouraged oftentimes is because their victory would not be immediate. And in the church, we often think this way. We want to pave a parking lot. Well, guess what? You're going to have to wait three years or two and a half years. And that's actually pretty fast, frankly. We didn't have to wait that long. We want to plant a church. And we look at other people planting other churches, and we see what we may call success, and we go, well, why are they getting something I'm not getting? And what is the first inclination? To jettison the patterns and the strategies laid down for us in Scripture and to do what we think works, the big and the fast and the famous, right? Right? As I had one seminary professor say to me, you know what, if I wanted to bring a bunch of people into the church, I could just put on a concert. That's all I got to do. You think the Rolling Stones have a hard time selling tickets? No. Why? They're well loved. People know them. The work of building a church is a plodding dominion. And again, Calvin says, the nations, however, were not completely routed by a single battle, nor in one short campaign but were gradually worn out and destroyed by many laborious contests. Here it is to be observed that arduous difficulties were thrown in the way of the people when the kings entered into a league and came forth to meet them, that is Israel, with united forces because it became necessary not only to war with single nations, but with an immense body which threatened to overwhelm them by one great onset. Ultimately, however, all of these violent attempts had no effect other than to make the power of God more manifest and to give brighter displays of mercy and faithfulness in the defense of his chosen people. Calvin is saying it is in the plotting and in the impossibility of the circumstances that the glory of God shines forth more brightly. It would not be a quick victory. But what do we fail to learn when the victory is given quickly? And what are we often mistakenly learning when we get it fast? Well, that it's mine. But when it's slow, what must we do? 
We must be patient, and we must depend upon the Lord for help. It would be a fight, but not in the same way the world fights. In fact, the first great fight wasn't even a fight, was it? The first great impediment to Israel's conquering the land, they triumphed over that city. How? Not by the sword, not by warfare, but by trumpet, by worship. Is God teaching them something there? That God can, if he so desires, destroy the mightiest armies of men through words. Words that he gives to us. Words that no city can withstand. You know the story of Jericho. I don't want to spoil it. We'll get there. (laughs) You all know it. They sang the city to the ground. But with trumpet blasts, they saw the walls fall. God is teaching Israel something. There would be a fight, and there were times where there was hot war, right? Conflict, swords were drawn, blood was shed. But God is ultimately the one who gives the victory. And we do it how he has prescribed. And when Israel did not do it as he prescribed, what happened? They lost. We fight as God instructs us. And that's why this series is entitled The Trumpet and the Sword. Because it is through the faithful worship and the struggle of wielding the sword of the Spirit that we, ultimately the church, will overcome. Both are essential. And both are given direction by God and we must wield them as he has instructed. Because Joshua can only take them so far. Joshua is quite anxious that he and the Israelites would be successful. But at the end, oftentimes, like many leaders experience, they can't bring the people as far as they would like. And that is what would happen with Joshua. And it is not as though Joshua failed. It's that men fail. Moses, Abraham, Joshua, Gideon, Samuel, David, Solomon, the prophets, the great kings of Israel, even the righteous ones after Solomon, like Hezekiah. They could take Israel so far and no farther because ultimately the one whom we need is not Joshua or Moses. It is the greater Joshua. Joshua had a desire to advance the glory of God. But we must read the Old Testament like there is a New Testament because guess what? We have a New Testament. And that's okay. We stand at the most glorious place in church history. And it is best because we have seen the kingdom of Christ advance further now than it has ever advanced. And so we ought to read Joshua and not only find a strange people, strange times, ancient lands, strange customs, but we ought to read ourselves into the pages and understand and seek to understand what is the Lord teaching us. Well, these things, that there is still a land to be conquered, but it is not Canaan. It is the nations, the tribes, the tongues, and the peoples of every country. It is the whole wide world. That is the land that Christ calls us to conquer. And he has given us an even greater weapon than the sword and the sling and the chariot and the bow. He has given us the Holy Spirit. And Christ leads us forth. And where Joshua failed, Christ has succeeded. He has succeeded first in his resurrection, in his ascension, in his taking the throne. And even now, he rules and reigns in such a way that we mere mortals, that is, lives that are temporary here on earth. 120, I don't know if any of us will live that long. Who knows? But whatever short time we have been given, we must see this, that the fight does not ultimately belong to us. It belongs to the Lord. It is a plan of deliverance, of provision, of consecration, of battle, of dominion, but through the greater Joshua. And the call remains. 
that through worship and the wielding of the sword, Christ will give us this land. Joshua could only take them so far, but Jesus takes us farther. Do you know why? Because it's all his anyway. It's his land. Christ gave to his disciples the great commission. He said, all authority has been given unto me in heaven and in earth or on earth. Go and make disciples. Christ continues to tear down cities. Christ continues to tear down strongholds. He continues to take dominion. And so what then is the exhortation for us? Verse 9. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid nor be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. If you've not had time, I would go, I would encourage you to go home and read the book of Jude. It's a long read. It's one chapter. In the book of Jude, he tells us something profound, if you don't already know it, but you do. But be reminded of it. And I ask my children this question every time we read the Old Testament. And we see God among his people. Which person is it? It is always the second person. It is Christ. It is Christ who led Israel through the Red Sea. It is Christ who led Israel through the Jordan. It is Christ who met with Moses at Sinai. It is Christ and his army of angels who destroyed the city of Jericho. It is the same Christ whom we have now seen with even greater glory who tells us, do not be afraid, for I am with you. For he is our Emmanuel, and he will give us victory. Let's pray. Oh Lord, our God.